Are there any investment opportunities left in the Daytona market? That question and a whole host of others being answered today by my friend and uh, dealer, uh, longtime dealer, Carl Cohen. Uh, looking forward to having you on the show. Thanks Carl. for having welcome. me, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You brought over a bunch of really interesting stuff um, that we'll talk about a little bit later. I've got five uh, watch questions for you. Today's episode is going to be entertaining as always, but very educational. Uh, I only have your time here for half an hour, so I want to make the most of, right? Uh, I want to extract all the knowledge possible. So thank yeah. Yeah, happy to do it. I'll All right. Try and educate, try and behave. All right, yeah, exactly. So, okay, for, first question, and we've got five here, and the five different subjects we're going to be you know, talking about, you know, kind of, we'll start off more broadly in your history. I know that you've been a watch dealer for a while, and use all these uh, questions as an opportunity to educate. Give me a story time. Tell me about one of the greatest, and then one of, you know, let's start off with one of the greatest, you know, stories you've got about, you know, kind of unforeseen, uh, unexpected score, right? Like maybe, a, I don't just mean financially, but even as a geek, like something that just came across your desk that was just almost wild and unbelievable in, particularly in the world of vintage watches. Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. I guess there are probably two, but I'll do a, a bridge version of the first. The first I bought, it was actually the first vintage, so to speak, Rolex I bought was a gold 1675, right? Uh, I was going through a scrap bin, basically. And at this time, people bought off what's known as the spec sheet, which was basically like, the price guide that people used, like analogous to a like Beckett for sports cards and so forth. And pretty much all jewelers use that as the barometer for the market and uh, how to price things because there wasn't a robust or a very large market for vintage uh, Rolex. Mm -hmm. So like it would say like 1675, which is a GMT master. And it would say like Fair, good, very good, excellent, and these are the prices. And how often would they print these sheets? I'm trying to remember if it was monthly or quarterly, but there, wa <laughs> there wasn't a lot of change, like right. from quarter to quarter, so to speak. And it was like, that's what it's worth. That's what you would pay for it. And then you would hopefully sell it for a little more. So at this time, uh, I bought a 1675 gold, which actually turned out to be a Concorde, which at the time I didn't even know really what a Concord was, yeah. but this was like 2006. And for everyone out there that's watching, a Concord is? Uh, it's a particular model or sort of setup of the 1675 GMT Master, and it gets the name because it was featured in the advertisements for the Concord airplane. And what distinguishes it is instead of having the uh, Mercedes hand, uh, you actually have an additional thin hand that's similar to a second hand kind of unusual yeah watch. yeah so like at the time it was just like it was a gold GMT yeah. so I bought it it had some issues the band was broken I figured out how to fix it I had it serviced and so forth and that was really cool and now another educational nugget here I that band is it was a presidential band uh, it was actually a Jubilee. Oh, okay, got it. But now those Jubilees did not have screws. Those Jubilees needed to be cut and soldered. Exactly. The vast majority were uh, sort of sized as is, so you needed a jeweler to cut, or, cut it or solder it. That is definitely a piece of vintage watch knowledge. It's, I think it comes as a surprise to many. Right. You can't just size a bracelet sort of casually. It actually needs to be cut by someone with... You know, that's delicate, right? Right. Otherwise, so, you end up with a bit of a bitch. So what often happens is you would find some that are just full length and stretched out like crazy, right? Because, like, people would wear them loose. Or they would size them exactly, and they'd wear over time. And it's like, unless your wrist is that size, what are you going to do? But now that's another follow-up question is, you just said that the bracelets were stretched out because people wore them loose, which is contrary to kind of popular opinion or popular misconception, which is a, wearing it tight would stretch it out. No, it's actually wearing right. it loose. Yeah, people, it's funny, people are like, oh, I don't want it to stretch, I don't want it to be so tight, but it's actually the movement and wear side to side over time with gold, which is generally 14 or 18. 14 is less pure, but it's a little more uh, durable. Mm -hmm. 18 is more pure. It's uh, a little less durable in the sense that it will wear a little more over time. So as you're moving and so forth, taking on and off slowly over time, you get a little breakdown between the pins and the links and so forth. But now that watch never ended up being a score because you never sold it. Right. So it's not a score, so to speak. But in a way it is if it you're is. not looking in pure uh, financial terms, right? Because it's what got me into this. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be such a large talking point for mm -hmm. me 
as I was uh, sort of getting into the market, educating myself, and also establishing a little credibility. Mm -hmm. Just when you have a watch like that mm -hmm. and you can speak to it, mm -hmm. um, it helps. I think some of the greatest scores uh, in, in any, you know, vintage watch collector's, you know, life are uh, when you look back, it's watches that you now own that you probably otherwise wouldn't have because you kind of got lucky. Yeah. Right? It's not about making five, ten, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. It's more about like, oh, wow, I, I know that now I'd be too cheap to buy this, but I got it then when they were kind of affordable. Right. And that's the best. And I have a couple of those. I mean, my, you know, my Tank Normal, which is not like this crazy watch, um, but I bought it cheap. My, Amer uh, my, my Sintra, the same. At yep. the time, I paid market value, and now they went up. And, you know, they're still not the most expensive watches in the world, but I know I'd be too, like my value analysis, my cost value would probably throw some red flags. And I'd be like, ah, I'm not going to have it. You right, know? right, for At sure. At the time, it made sense. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I guess going back to sort of, you know, the second one or one that I've mm -hmm. done done well with or that I like bought to sell or could have bought to sell and didn't is actually a really rare Submariner. And at the time, I just didn't have the knowledge or education. It was sort of an anomaly. And a number of people I asked, it was sort of a split second decision. Uh, people weren't, you know, weren't confident and I wasn't. And at the time, this was like, 2008 so i was still collecting i wasn't even doing this as a business mm -hmm. so i didn't have money to take a mm -hmm. shot and it was actually a um 6536 submariner oh my god early early and what was interesting and threw me off because i didn't know enough about it is generally on vintage watches you find the model number at 12 mm -hmm. right and serial number at six is it flipped it was flipped and i was like this doesn't make sense. This isn't right. Um, oh, geez. I think it's been re-engraved or something's off here. And uh, what was off is I didn't have the knowledge. Yeah. Wow. And uh, what year was that around? I want to say it was mid-50s or so. And uh, just for people who don't know, again, I said the position of the serial and model number. But very rarely, especially on some of these early models, particularly in the... Um, what's known as the professional models, mm -hmm. but we've come to call sport models, you would find a reverse, mm -hmm. which was very, very uncommon mm -hmm. and has extreme collectability as well as a, a large price premium. Yes, and so you missed that one. Yeah, and then there's some others I've bought that I will sell, but I just haven't yet mm -hmm. because I still see value or find mm -hmm. it interesting. Yeah. And fortunately, I'm in a position where... You can hold. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, so. for, and, and you get to enjoy them in the meantime. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a special thing. Next question, moving into, and we've got some amazing vintage watches here that we'll talk a little bit about a little bit later. Some Stella dials, a really cool white gold Rolex. We went Rolex heavy here, but there's also a, a crazy quorum that we'll talk about. We're going to be featuring all of these watches on our podcast community called The Zero. So if you want to see all these watches and hear Golf Carl's thoughts on them and why you brought them, head on over there. But the second question I've got for you is, today's episode is sponsored by our friends over at Chef IQ, the geniuses behind the world's smallest and thinnest wireless meat thermometer. Say goodbye to overcooking roasts, undercooking chicken, being anxious when you have to use your air fryer, deep fryer, stove, everything, because Chef IQ has it all figured out because it is a science. Chef IQ's wireless meat thermometer, which by the way, comes in one, two, and three probe configurations and links up to your app right here, which has a million recipes, it's unbelievable, um, is incredible. This is the solution to all of your cooking anxiety. You're, you're everything you're leaving up to chance, really, and if not, you're leaving up to chance, then you're obsessing over the science of what you already know how to do, and that's not really fun when you're entertaining either, um, but Chef IQ is just, it's just the answer to your prayers. It's the answer to your prayers in your kitchen. It, it makes entertaining so much more enjoyable it's one of the greatest gifts. We've been working with them for so long. I can't tell you how many people here in the Theo and Harris community have purchased a Chef IQ and given you know, it away as a gift for Christmas or for Father's Day or for their own birthday or whatever. And everyone is so thrilled um, because the product just speaks for itself. Um, it truly changes the way you approach cooking in the kitchen. It, it, it makes you so much more open to being inventive and having fun with the recipes while you know reducing your anxiety because you've got your timers. They, they tell you exactly when to pull out you know, your, your roast or your chicken or your fish or whatever it may be. And it just, it just makes your life just really honestly a lot better. So I couldn't possibly recommend Chef IQ more. Head down to the link below. And uh, if you don't already have one, make one yours. And if you do have one, buy another because uh, I don't know, you never have enough Chef IQ. That's it. This is modern and, 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 and maybe neither is your favorite. 
But uh, 1159 or offshore? I'm going 1159. Yeah, me too. I actually like it. So do I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like uh, sort of divisive, I guess, but like offshore is not my thing. And I think they've done some really interesting things in the 1159. Mm -hmm. If you look at it purely for what it is, the design, the crystal, the dial, like it's pretty remarkable. I don't know if it's um, the marketing or that it doesn't fit within sort of the ethos of how people view AP mm -hmm. now, but like, it's actually an amazing watch, I think, and some of the complications and special dials they've came up, come out with are mm -hmm. really interesting. The price point scares me a little. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable buying one at retail mm -hmm. or even like a decent discount, but on the secondary market, they're out there and available mm -hmm. and it's... It's interesting. I agree. I think they're great watches. I think that, you know, AP, not only does that watch make sense as a, you know, sibling to the Royal Oak, right? Because the, that, that case design is just, it, it stays within that same, you know, design language. But, you know, I think that for the world and where we are, it, it does make sense as, you know, a quote unquote dress watch, right? Sure. Because it is, you know, a little bit thicker and a little bit bulkier and a little bit more aggressive. It very much like the Royal Oak did to the Submariner, it was kind of, uh, you know, uh, yes, while we're still in the world of sport, we are more elegant, right? And it's the same thing with, with his, right? We're still in the world of dress, but we're more rugged. A lot of guys aren't, I don't think, necessarily comfortable or they don't think that a, a Calatrava would be, right, like, uh, you know, would make sense in their life because it's so delicate and grandpa-y. Right. But 1159 is actually like, that's yeah, pretty sporty. And it's kind of aggressive and it's kind of young and ballsy. And I think it makes sense. I think it really makes sense. I agree. I think, uh, in my opinion, part of the lack of interest is it just hasn't been marketed well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Royal Oak markets itself, right? Mm -hmm. But they're, they, they've picked back up with these collabs, mm -hmm. limited editions mm -hmm. and so forth, which is what they did early on mm -hmm. with the model, right? Mm -hmm. But they just haven't done much with the 1159. But, well, who has done much with anything is a good question. Yeah, right? it is. I mean, I don't, I mean, a lot of these brands do well with their flagship pieces and then have a very hard time actually bringing anything else to the market. They also don't really, to your point, advertise anything much at all. I look back and flip through old advertisements and you see some stuff and it just was so bold and so ballsy and so true, right? Uh, I mean, Laurel Piana recently or in the last couple of years released a good ad. I don't know how familiar you are with that whole shoe world. Sure. But they make, you know, they make this, you know, summer walk and open walk collection and then all the other brands dupe them, right? Right. You know, and they're actually good. So, you know, LP kind of had this predicament. Well, what do we, what do we do about that? What do we, what do we do about this big threat to which they released an article, I think in, in the Wall Street Journal or something like that. York Times, and it was worn by those who do, copied by those who don't, and it was kind of good marketing. Yeah. And I don't think that's true. Obviously, it's it's not it's nonsense to even say it. But of course, that's your position. It kind of has to be. The old Wall Street Journal ad used to be, you know, money talks, we translate. Good marketing, sure. ballsy marketing. You know, yeah. It's you know, kind of putting some putting some cojones on the table. Watch brands don't do that enough. I think that they're a little bit too mealy mouth, a little bit too Swiss, maybe, and they've lost that, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of. I don't know. I don't know what the word is. Kind of oomph. They've lost a, they've lost a perspective, I think. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I saw someone post the other day on some social media, and it was actually ads for old IWCs, mm. which I don't know if you're familiar with these or not. But I, so I remember some they're, of the, they're pretty bold they're pretty and bold. like direct. They're a little misogynistic. Yes, misogynistic, right? Uh, but, something about women always being late and there's a yeah, car Yeah, but like... They took a position and took a strong <laughs> position, which I don't necessarily agree with it. I mean, but at least you are marketing. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. marketing. Yeah. That's like they they put their flag in the sand and said, like, this is where we stand, yeah. which to your point, you don't see that often at anymore. And you it's don't. just sort of copycat. It's sort of copycat. And I don't think a lot of it is even that effective. I mean, to, to what degree is a celebrity endorsement into a watch brand effective? And, and how much does it cost? I mean, you know, I'm sure that in some demographics, yes, putting a, a face on the piece makes sense. I think at certain price points, it makes sense, right? But once you go up market, I don't think that people that are going to be spending 15, 20, 30,000 dollars on a watch are going to be that interested uh, in the celebrity that's wearing it necessarily i agree and i think particularly in the u.s market yeah if you look at not only watches but other products mm -hmm. whether it's you know high-end shoes mm -hmm. 
uh, for instance, coffee mm -hmm. that you see with an espresso mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, watches, uh, it seems to me to be more effective in other markets. I agree. Particularly in Asia. Yes. Relative to the United States. Yes. Where, you know, when I started in this business and working retail, which was in the two, uh, like late, late 90s, mm -hmm. circa 2000, you saw like a little celebrity endorsement, right? Yeah, you'd you'd have DiCaprio the, with Tag Heuer. Right? Tag Heuer, you had a number of different mm -hmm. people. They'd do it with some of the Formula One drivers. Mm -hmm. There was Jeff Gordon for a hot second. They actually had Grant Hill, the basketball yeah, sure. player. And they were, they were trying a lot of different things, but at the price point that was at, it made sense, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could market to a certain demographic and the price point wasn't outrageous, mm -hmm. so it was still aspirational. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I worked with Rolex a lot. You didn't see endorser, mm -hmm. in, endorsers, mm -hmm. so to speak. You were, really don't now either, but you would see an ad with Arnold Palmer right. or Jack Nicklaus. Right. And well, that was like, that was it. That was the market. But that sort of speaks to like, what is an activation? Then now we're getting into real marketing talk about what does an activation look like? And it doesn't begin and end with the person's face. It's, well, how believable, uh, how impactful is it, right? Sure. Arnold Palmer is a great example, right? I mean, or Jack Nicholas. Right? These are great examples of a real activation, people that actually wore these watches. And, you know, it's almost like, I can't, it's, it's kind of a funny one, but I can't tell you how many times people have asked me or t t mentioned to me that uh, Uncle Buck was a thing with... They watched it and they saw the gold president on their wrist. It was like, I just kept staring at it all movie because it was so prominent. Like that's real, again, whether you like the watch or not, it's like, it was a real like integrated activation, very much, obviously it's, it's different, but in principle it's the same to Aston Martin and James Bond, right? It is, it is actually playing a role. It is constantly seen. It is not just on a billboard, right? The billboard alone isn't going to move it, right? Sure. There's gotta be some level of like, you know, almost like a trance. Right, you need to kind of bring them into trance mode where you've got, you know, uh, Rami Malek, I think, has been behind some of the least successful Cartier ads of all time. It's, they're just bad ads. Right. You know, they're just, they're just bad. There's no actual native or believable activation at all. Um, but, right. And I think know. a lot of the ones that have been successful were organic and maybe yes. didn't even start out that way. I mean, For you sure. look at that tag uh, 6000 series, mm -hmm. I think, the all gold that mm -hmm. was worn, yeah. or maybe it was the link. Uh, in the Wolf of Wall, Wall Street, Street, right? Yeah. Or you have classic Cartier and Wall Street, right? right? Which people oh, the Carré call the, and the Panther. Yeah, they call the Gecko, yeah. right? And yeah. it's like that will forever be linked with that. That's exactly right. You know, I think again we can move on from the subject in a second, but you know, uh, hundred percent Succession, the TV show, had a huge influence on clothing. Uh, the big Cartier with Shiv, people were really talking about that, and then Laura Piana really did incredibly well with uh, Kendall. Right? People were like, "What does old money look like?" That became a big thing on social media. What is old money? What is old money? People want to move. People wanted to move away, at least for that point in time, away from like branded clothes. Sure. and tight clothing and they start, you know, it was interesting, right? Yeah, I mean, quiet luxury. Yeah, quiet luxury, you know? And again, no matter how long that lasts or whatever, it, it, you know, those more immersive experiences, I think, allow for better sales pitches. You yeah. know, uh, Ray Donovan with Mercedes-Benz, another one. But anyway, uh, next question. This is something that I haven't really heard people talk about too much, but I think you can bring something to it. Um, Frank Mueller. Okay. Um, people are now kind of talking about some of the early stuff, um, some of those, I guess, like Curvex pieces or sure. whatever. Um, they're coming a little bit more into the scene. Um, but no one was there when it was happening, or most, most people weren't there when it was happening. People my age weren't there when it was happening originally. Give me some sort of a history of that brand on the earlier side, on the retail side. Why was it successful? Was it successful? You know, what was its downfall? Help me understand that brand a little bit. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to the extent that I'm educated yep. on it. But I think the first question or point you mentioned is there's sort of this inter interest or resurgence. And I think that's a, more of a byproduct right now of the market we're in. And also there's this need or desire, I think, amongst collectors, someone wants to be the person to unearth something or yes. make it cool yes. and then have followers and so forth. So I know people who just like like being the person to discover or yes. bring something back, like which is cool as long as it's authentic. Mm -hmm. So I think there are people who are either, you know, following the trend and with the times, there are the people who are the laggards and then there are people who are either looking for something different and new which may be old because they actually like it mm -hmm. or because they want to make a statement mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying that's the case with mm -hmm. this particular brand, mm -hmm. but I think that's what's happened a lot with some models in that brand mm -hmm. as well as others. I mean, there's been a huge interest in early Breguet as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. like 90s. With the brand, I think it was it was different. You know, at the time it was avant-garde. The, mm -hmm. the crazy number sticks out. Mm -hmm. It's just something that people wanted. Mm -hmm. And like there was demand, it was positioned well. You know, it was sold at a much smaller group or network of authorized dealers mm -hmm. than it is now. Mm -hmm. You know, you could find it at Bergdorf mm -hmm. and better jewelers. So I think there was just interest. The shape was a little different. Mm -hmm. It was loud because there were diamonds. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, you know, it was interesting. And I think some of the names of the models uh, worked well, too, yeah. with sort of that demographic. I think what happened with the brand as is the case with a number of brands is you have a hit and you do well and then what's next right well, what's next and right. money comes in there's right. pressure to grow you have to monetize it and what happens you expand your door count right you make a lot more product yep and you employ you, you you delude the brand unfortunately yep. i mean yep. it, it happens that's not to say that it wasn't successful but yeah. you reach this tipping point where it's downhill yeah and yep. then what happens and historically until the last few years, like that brand, you know, you could buy for a lot of models pre-owned for 20 cents, 15 yeah. cents on the dollar. And yeah. you didn't really want it. And that's, I agree with you. Right? Some, some brands, most brands are not positioned to grow or their, their product isn't even in, a, in alignment with growth. They may have reached their own capacity right, right before they need to right, basically either A, try to sell this product to more people that aren't fundamentally interested right it's just like a it's like a misunderstanding of like their own market research like we kind of are selling these watches to everyone that wants one so what happens if we spend another 10 million dollars on well you need to change the product well now you're right uh, now you have a problem right you have an, you have a product hit but this next product that you're trying to sell to all this other group of people is that in is that going to come close or are we just right? Or are you a, or are you a twenty-five million dollar company? And you're not going to be at fifty million. I'm not, I'm not making up numbers here, but that's what happens a lot of the time, right? right? I mean, Which is, I think, it's sort of twofolded, right? Because I think in business and business, particularly in the United States, the way it's seen is great. You've grown. You're a twenty-five million dollar company. You got to get to fifty to all, and a hundred and two <laughs> and half growth, a billion. Growth is but the like, crude oil of the cancer cell. Right, yeah. but if you're successful at yeah. twenty-five million, you can satisfy demand and you're running a good business. What's wrong with that? Everyone's making millions of dollars. Why is this so bad? Right. right. But we've seen this very much in the, in the watch industry, just in general, not only on the product end, but on the on the uh, what influencer, not influencer, but journalism end, right? What uh, journalism? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. We don't need to get too into it, but we know that's true, right? You can run a really successful, profitable five or ten million dollar company, but and then and then go down a hallway where you end up running an unprofitable $75 million sure. company. I mean, and it's a mess. And you're just hoping at some point that someone kind of bails you out and, and you know, pays more. You know, that's, right. you know it's, rev revenues become a dirty word. But we don't need to get into that. But the next subject here is Rolex Daytonas. Right? This is the, the conversation that we kind of queued up this video with. You know, obviously, a, 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 you know, a model that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've been buying and selling for decades at this point, model that really blew up before and then during especially COVID uh, and then things have come down both on the, you know, just flip end, secondary market end, that's cooled down, but also even on the collectible end. I know people that have lost quite a bit of money buying neat and different Daytonas. Are there any Daytonas left in the market that are, you think are stable or maybe have upward mobility in the future? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it in part is a byproduct of what does this profitability or upside mean, right? Like, what's your horizon? Right. Because if you want to buy something and sell it in a year, like, I don't know. No idea. But if you're going to buy it because you like the model and you have a longer horizon, five, ten years, yeah. uh, I think Zenith Daytona's stainless steel yeah. or even gold in excellent condition mm -hmm. are a great buy. You know, the, that's a 16520. The model after is a 116520. Mm -hmm. uh, that model's crept back up, but there's just so many out there. There are of the Zeniths as well, but to me at this point, as we've had three models after that, it's almost a transitional mm -hmm. model now, mm -hmm. 
where you can see the four digit models, which could be a 6263, 6265, 6239, which doesn't have the mm -hmm. screw pushers, it's pump, pump pusher. But then you get into the Zenith, which is a five digit, which started from roughly 88 to mm -hmm. about 2000. Mm -hmm. You can see the evolution of the watch mm -hmm. and you can see that it was a great design because the current model uh, that they've come out with, if you look at the dial, the sub dials and display, it looks very much like, the in my mind, the uh, Zenith Daytona. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great model. Then there are, of course, some Daytonas that are more of the unique references mm -hmm. or could be a bit more esoteric with mm -hmm. some of the stone dials. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I love the Beach Daytonas, which is not a Zenith, it's the Rolex 4130 mm -hmm. movement. But those models weren't that popular at mm -hmm. the time. I mean, I remember buying them them as cheap as 12,000 with papers mm -hmm. and they've gone up five, six X yeah. from that. The caution there I would give is that they were made in a short range of like a P, K or Y serial, That's right? right. That's, That's right. like the correct beach. What happened is their service styles that in other markets are not that hard to get if you send your watch through Rolex service. In the U.S., it's more challenging um, because they, it's basically when you have something serviced, you have to at this point change what you have for what you have, right. where previously you could not. But what you see is you see a lot of these Beach Daytona dials, which could be uh, Pink Mother of Pearl. You could have Blue, which is turquoise. You could have Grossler, not Grossler, uh, slip in my mind but the green and then you could also have yellow which is mother of pearl mm -hmm. but now people have found a way to get those dials and put them on serial mm -hmm. numbered watches that aren't pk or mm -hmm. y so like is it still a beach so right. my advice is if you're going to do it buy it inexpensively in a pk or y or buy the full set and know it's correct right buy it right and hold it yeah but okay. i think they're cool they're interesting yeah. um Oh, you've always been a, you know, I think you've always been, since the day that I met you about 10 years ago, really just into those odd dials at the time, specifically in yellow gold, right, day dates and things like that, date just and day dates. I remember, you know, meeting you for the first time and saying, oh my God, the, the collection at the time of those odd dials I'd never even seen before. I mean, sure. or I'd heard, I knew they existed. I'd seen them on like the internet a couple of times, but then I just saw this collection that you had at the time of, of all of these wild dials. And I said, I, I, I remember looking at your role that, that day and being like, you know, this could be my watch collection. I, yeah. I can just have 10 of these, you know, which, at the, you know, of course, duh. But I guess the point is that it's only one model, really. Right. You, know, it's, you know, but the colors are just wild. Yeah. I love those watches. Yeah, I they're awesome. Them. They're fun. Yeah. I mean, we actually got a, a little ladies uh, piece there, right? That's a pretty odd dial. That's that's a, a, like a Stella? or a... Yeah, it's a Stella. It's sort of a... Uh, you're, you're better versed in... Uh, Pantones than I am. Oh, I but, don't know. Uh, yeah, but it's sort of a like orangish, yes. red. Yes. Uh, I would call it like a sherbet. Yes. Almost, yeah. uh, ladies, and it's it's cool because um, with that size, particularly, I think it's fun to accessorize, put different straps on, mm -hmm. and so forth. A because I find it interesting, mm -hmm. but B you'll find great watches with guess what stretch bands. Right. So like, what are you gonna do? Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, that, that's one that I like. I yeah. love the 26 millimeters. People have teased me for years because I've worn them and mm -hmm. I'm like, they're cool, they're, they're comfortable. Cool, and yeah. like, I like them and I can buy it for a fraction of a 36. So exactly. like, why not? Exactly. But yeah, and, and it's, it's really like, you know, again, I, I, you know, I love, I love uh, watches, people, not just for me, but I love my other people's wrists. I just love looking at them, you know, and I don't think that, you know, so, well, there are plenty of men's watches that I'd love to look at and I just know I'll never own just because of how you know, prohibitive they are, right, M you know, with the money of it, right? But then you can see it in the ladies' version and be like, well... I can still stare at it from across the room if uh, if your wife has it, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite nice. It's like, I can't have the men's one, but she can have the ladies and I can just stare at her wrist. You yeah, know? So, that makes sense. Yeah, it's like, uh, eyes, uh, eyes are up here. It's like, well, I was looking at your wrist. Right, you know? but, I wasn't looking there. Exactly. Um, all right, la last question here then. Um, um, 
uh, we're going to do it overrated, underrated, appropriately rated on, uh, on, I think, on an interesting, you know, paddock reference that's been around for a while. 5070. What are your thoughts on the 5070? I think it's currently underrated. Yeah, so, I love it. Yeah. I think there's value there. Yeah. And uh, it's actually an awesome walk. <laughs> it's awesome. It's huge, but it's great. But, like, dollars for dollars for that money, like, name me a better watch. Can't. I don't think you can. Yeah. Favorite uh, configuration? I just like the black. I don't know why. Black with yellow, right? Yeah. It's fantastic. I know. If, if you gave me one with diamonds, I'd be okay with the diamond bezel. Take it in a heartbeat. Right? I, I think that more and more people are warming up to really good baguettes. I think so. Yeah. I've, I've actually had a number of clients lately come to me wanting to sell more of the sport professional stuff and moving towards something yeah. like that. Some uh, interesting Calatravas, yeah. World Times, mm -hmm. they're well-priced, just a little more classic, uh, timeless, a little elevated, I yes. would say. Yes, so 100%. I, I think 5070 is a great watch if you, if you find it at a good price. They're just such beautiful designs and very historical, right? I right. Mean, they're, they're, that, that case essentially came out of the archives and, uh, you know, and it's, it's just a perfect watch. I mean, it's just a, I think it's basically a perfect watch. Again, a little bit big on my wrist, uh, but probably in the vicinity of perfect. I also love 5170P with the blue vignette and the, you yeah. know, and the baguettes. I mean, fantastic. But at 130 or maybe, I don't know, probably maybe even a little bit more, it's a lot of money. Right, That's whereas a lot of money. you can pick yeah. 5070P up, you know. Yeah, oh, right. Sub 60. Yeah, which is insane. Yeah. I mean, it's just a lot of, it's just people aren't, don't look at certain places. Right. That's what it is. It's just not looking there. It's for no other reason than that. And then as soon as everyone's looking, well, you missed the boat. Right. You know, so uh, 100%, 100%. Well, Carl, uh, we're not done with you because we're going to go on over to the Zero right now. And if you guys aren't already a member, go ahead and take a look and join because we're going to go through all of these watches that you're seeing here and why they're interesting. And, and there's just some great stuff here. And you know, uh, secret or secret. Uh, and uh, I think maybe one of these will be coming home with me today. So uh, if you want to know which one, go ahead and uh, go ahead and join the Zero and... Follow, uh, follow along. See you over there.